I think that most people, regardless of their political, religious or moral views, could agree on one thing. And that is, the 21st century hasn't exactly started out full of hope and promise, has it? Not by a long shot. It took the 20th century at least 14 years to the year 1914 to bring us World War I and the disaster it caused across the world. It took the 21st century less than two years before giving us 9-11 and all the sorrows it has left in its wake. No question, the world we are living in now and what we are leaving to the next generation is a very scary place. Humans have proven capable of a lot of evil and nothing seems to be changing in that regard. And yet what's amazing is the Bible teaching that God loves us and loves the world despite all the evil in it. In today's program, we will look at the great hope that God offers to all of us, regardless of the bad things that we've all done. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. In 2013, a British and Australian made war film, The Railway Man, hit the theatres starring Colin Firth, Nicole Kidman and Jeremy Irvine. It was a powerful story of an English prisoner of war in World War II who had been tortured by his Japanese captors. The movie told not just of his terrible time at their hands, but also of the terrible mental anguish he suffered for decades afterwards. It was caused by what we now call PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. It also told of his reconciliation with one of his tormentors. That's what the movie was really about. Reconciliation instead of vengeance. Yes, The Railway Man could have been just another revenge movie, like True Grit, Kill Bill or The Gladiator. But instead, it was just the opposite. Also, unlike Captain America, The Hunger Games or Inception, The Railway Man was based on a true story. It came from a book called, yes, The Railway Man. The author was the British prisoner of war himself, Eric Lomax. Of course, the cinematic version took all sorts of dramatic liberties and licenses. That is, it made up scenes that never really happened and that weren't in the book. Yet the reality of what really did happen is powerful. And that's because, as I said, it's a story about forgiveness for what could have been justly seen as unforgivable. It's because it's a story about grace and reconciliation when it could have seemed that vengeance, cold hard revenge, not grace or reconciliation, was what the story really called for. That's why, in its own way, The Railway Man reveals an amazing truth about how God relates to human beings in all our pettiness, nastiness, and sometimes even outright evil. I know, I know, there are many lovely people out there. We might even consider ourselves to be one of them. And perhaps we are. We certainly are nicer than some of the horrors we read about or see on the news. But looking at the long history of the world, or even the last century, or even our century now, what do we see? Do we see lots and lots of nice people doing lots and lots of nice things? Or do we see lots and lots of humans doing evil and bad things? And do we see it once in a while as a rarity? Or do we see it over and over again? You know the answer as well as I do. And yet, one of the central points of the Bible is that despite all the evil and the bad that we do, God loves us anyway. 
Notice what the Bible says here in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is for sure the most famous Bible text ever. It has almost become a cliche. And as a result, it often comes in one ear and out the other, as cliches are known to do. But it shouldn't, because it teaches one of the most profound and fundamental truths ever. In other words, despite the violence, the wars, the hatred, the bigotry, the genocide, the corruption, the economic exploitation, the man-made pollution, despite all the bad things that humans have done and are doing now, God still loves the world. It means that He loves us, we who are the perpetrators of so much bad. In fact, it gets even better. See what the next verse says in John chapter 3 and verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That is, despite the evil and terrible deeds that humans have perpetrated and still do perpetrate, deeds that should give just cause for our condemnation, Jesus came to save us, not to condemn us. That is, Jesus did not bring condemnation, vengeance or revenge. He came to bring forgiveness, to bring reconciliation and to bring grace. And these are the things that we can see revealed on a smaller scale in the story of Eric Lomax, the railway man. The background of his story is this. During World War II, the Japanese had quickly advanced through South Asia. In the beginning months of 1942, the Empire of Japan invaded the stronghold of Singapore, which was at that time the major British military base in Southeast Asia. It had even been nicknamed the Gibraltar of the East, and the rock was now in enemy hands. It also resulted in the capture of tens of thousands of British, Indian and Australian soldiers. This included a 23-year-old British signals officer named Eric Lomax. He was one of close to 60,000 other Allied prisoners of war forced by the Japanese to work on building the notorious Burma Siam Railway through a horrific disease-infested jungle. In fact, the building of this railway and the horrible conditions and the brutality of their captors was captured in a famous old movie, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Yet no matter how horrific the condition, no one sitting at home watching the movie could come close to experiencing the suffering these men endured. And it got much worse for Eric Lomax. As the movie portrayed, and as he wrote in his book, Lomax and six colleagues built tiny radio receivers out of odds and ends they found dispersed in the camps they were in. All they were doing was simply trying to get information about the outside world, anything, in order to boost the morale of their starved, beaten, and in some cases, dying colleagues. Anyway, somehow they were found out. To this day, Lomax didn't know how they'd been uncovered. All seven were arrested and tortured by military police, the Kempai Tai. The Japanese thought the radio was part of a spying operation. Over time, six of the accused died. Lomax wrote about not just the beatings, but how he was also waterboarded. After a severe beating, in which an interpreter stood over him and threatened him with death, Lomax faced the following. The one torturing me went off to the side and I saw him coming back holding a hosepipe dribbling with water. He directed the full flow of the now gushing pipe onto my nostrils and mouth at a distance of only a few inches. Water poured down my windpipe and throat and filled my lungs and stomach. The torrent was unimaginably choking. This is the sensation of drowning on dry land on a hot, dry afternoon. 
Your humanity bursts from within you as you gag and choke. I tried very hard to will unconsciousness, but no relief came. I had nothing to say. I was beyond invention, so they turned on the tap again, and again there was that nausea of rising water from inside my bodily cavity, a flood welling up from within and choking me. Despite the horrific treatment and threat of death, Eric Lomax survived and returned home. But he was a severely damaged man, emotionally as well as physically. He had many of the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. It affected every aspect of his life, personal and professional. The after effects destroyed one marriage and came close to destroying his second. That is, years after the war, his tormentors were still tormenting him. And there was one who remained especially in his mind. He was the interpreter who took part in the torture. Lomax remembered the man as standing over him, demanding answers to the questions and threatening him with death. Lomax, you will be killed no matter what happens, Eric remembered him saying. For some reason, this man stood out in his mind all those years afterward and was the focus of his hatred and desire for revenge. At the end of the war, I would have been happy to murder him. Decades later, as Eric still struggled with his memories, he received a newspaper cutting from the Japanese Times from a fellow former prisoner of war. It was about a former Japanese soldier who had been helping the Allies to find the graves of their dead. But what stunned Eric Lomax was the picture of this former soldier. It was the man who had been the focal point of his bitter memories. It was the man he had for decades wanted to kill. And he was still alive. And what's more, he was where Eric could get to him. He even knew his name now. Takashi Nagase. Eric Lomax finally had his man. Eric Lomax finally could get the revenge that he had long fantasized about and knew that he deserved. He could finally give Takashi Nagase the justice that had long been overdue. Yet for two years, Eric Lomax did nothing. He didn't know what to do or how to do it. Those counselling him through the continued trauma of his post-traumatic stress disorder had warned him about the dangers of confrontation. He needed to be careful before proceeding. Then, Eric received an English translation of a memoir that Takashi Nagase had written. It was called Crosses and Tigers, and in it, he wrote about, with great remorse, the terrible way he had mistreated the prisoners of war. On page 15, he had described in detail how he had treated one prisoner in particular. As Lomax read, he was stunned. He was reading about his own torture. Enough was enough. Something had to be done. But instead of vengeance, instead of violence, Instead of seeking justice, Eric did something else. He began to write letters to Takashi Nagase. And Takashi Nagase wrote back to him. And after many long decades, these two men met. And yes, there were tears and there was remorse. And indeed, there was forgiveness. Eric Lomax had learned to forgive the man whom he had hated so deeply and for so long, and with good cause too. And though the scars remained until his death, Eric Lomax began to find some of the peace that had for so long eluded him. Toward the end of his book, The Railway Man, Eric Lomax wrote about his trip to Japan and meeting Takashi Nagase. In all the time I spent in Japan, I never felt a flash of the anger I had harboured against Nagasi all those years. No backwash of that surge of murderous intent I'd felt on finding out that one of them was still alive. As I said, whatever the liberties taken in the 2013 version of the movie, 
It was powerful because it just wasn't another revenge movie. It was about something so much more powerful than revenge, and that is forgiveness, especially when it's not deserved. Yes, Takashi Nagase was sorry for what he had done, but still, is that all it takes? Commit atrocities, then afterward apologize for them and all is well, all is atoned for, all is now good? A German writer named Herbert Marcuse once wrote, One cannot and should not go around happily killing and torturing, and then when the moment has come, simply ask and receive forgiveness. No question, on one level, Marcuse is right. People who commit horrific crimes, regardless of their later repentance, shouldn't be let off the hook just because they later apologise for it. Could you imagine some of the most infamous Nazi war criminals simply saying, oops, we're really sorry for our murder of millions and then being let go free and clear? No, that's not how it works or how it should work, at least on one level. But you know, on another level, that's exactly how it works. At least it is with God. It can be seen in the gospel when there is true remorse and repentance. The Bible teaches one of the most fascinating beliefs, one that is not really found in any other faith. It teaches the truth of substitutionary atonement. Now, that's a fancy term for the teaching that 2,000 years ago on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for all human evil. That is, all the terrible things that we see done now, or that have been done, or that will be done. Jesus paid the penalty for it all. Not that he paid the legal penalty that our human courts require. It doesn't mean that if we commit crimes, the cross somehow absolves us of that crime and the punishment it will bring from human courts of law. No, it means instead that before God, you can be forgiven for the things you've done wrong because Jesus has paid for it already. It means that the justice your evil would deservedly bring upon you fell instead upon Jesus. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to the Bible, Jesus was to come and die for what? For our sins. That is, you and me, and Tagashi Nagase, and for the Nazis, and for everyone, everywhere, at all times and all places. No one was left out, not one. And this means that none of their evil deeds were left out either. Christ's death was for the whole world and all the evil perpetrated in it. Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Did you read that? He was the atoning sacrifice. You know, we often say that someone made atonement for his or her bad deeds. They paid the penalty, the fine, or they did community service, or they did the jail time, or whatever they did, they made it right. They did what was needed in order to no longer have the deed held against them. It's over and done, at least in the eyes of human law. Now let's look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in our God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Again, we have the idea of atonement. But Jesus made the atonement for us because we can't do it ourselves. Yes, Jesus did this work of atonement for the whole world. Jesus paid the penalty for everyone, everywhere. Again, that doesn't mean people don't have to pay the legal penalties here and now for their crimes. It means instead 
that before God, every single human being, ourselves included, can have our sins washed away, cancelled, forgiven. Yes, even the worst among us, the worst, Jesus paid the penalty for them as well. Atonement can be described as being at one with Jesus because it is He who saves us from our sins. That's why the Bible, when talking about Jesus on the cross, said this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. How much clearer could it be? The just Jesus dying for the unjust, which is the rest of us. The Bible says that we have all sinned, that we have all done wrong. Sure, we might not have done what Takashi Nagasa had done or what the ISIS murderer did, but aren't we all guilty of something? I mean, who hasn't felt some guilt, some shame over what you might have done in your lifetime? How would you like to have every single bad thing that you've ever done put on Facebook? Would you not feel shame? But what I want to tell you right now is that at the cross, atonement for whatever you have done has been made. If you want to be right with God, there is nothing you can do to atone for your past. Jesus has done that work of atonement already for you. That's what happened at the cross. That's why it's called the good news. But here's the crucial point, what you mustn't miss. Yes, Jesus has done this for you, for me, for all of us. But you have to accept it for yourself. This atonement is not automatically granted upon you, like some kind of universal amnesty. Yes, the provision has been made, but it is not forced upon anyone. You need to make the choice to accept it. You need to admit that you've done wrong. You need to confess your sins, your evil thoughts and actions, and claim for yourself the forgiveness of sin, a forgiveness that you do not deserve, but that is graciously offered to you by Jesus. Eric Lomax offered forgiveness to someone who, one could argue, didn't deserve it. Jesus is willing to do this and much more for you and me. We just need to accept this offer as we pray. Father, we thank you for your offer of forgiveness. Give us the humility to come before you in our great need, because our need is the only valid claim we have for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is changing lives around the world. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.